And this topic is near and dear to my heart because people who are living with chronic migraines are living with chronic stress. Even if your life isn't stressful, having headaches every day or almost every day is stressful on your body. And so physically what happens is that your body depletes your hormones. Let me show you why. This is an overview of how your body makes hormones and makes stress chemicals. And there's, it looks complicated, but I'm going to break it down for you. So it all starts out here in the upper left with a compound called pregnenolone. And you'll notice that that can go to make these other pathways. And if you just follow me through the maze here, ignore all the complicated names, but notice that we land at cortisol. I think many of us have heard that cortisol is our main stress chemical. Okay. So if your body is making a lot of cortisol, making a lot of cortisol, you get another headache, you make more cortisol, you're, I, whoops, there we go. Make it bigger mm -hmm. again. You know, you're having more Anytime you're having more headaches, you're making more of that cortisol and your body gets used to making a lot of cortisol, this pathway gets ramped up. So what happens though, is that pregnenolone gets depleted. So if we go back up here, everything down this pathway is going to cortisol, which means there isn't a lot left over to go this way, right? Because what else can happen? You can go down this other pathway of the maze and you can make your hormones, testosterone, estrone, estradiol, estriol. So when there is not enough of this precursor because your body is constantly having migraines and constantly having to make cortisol, then there's not enough left over to make your hormones. I think this is a really key component because people who have menstrual migraines get all wrapped up in thinking about how do I change my birth control pills? How do I, should I get an IUD? Should I get a progesterone only pill? Like people are so programmed to think that manipulating the hormones is the only answer to that equation. But if we take a step back and look at the root cause there, part of the problem that's happening is stress because of the headaches. So if we instead focus on how do we physiologically shift our body out of stress, then we can fix the hormones naturally. Yes. I love that. Yeah. And that is one of the reasons why stress is such a huge trigger. It's not just the cortisol, right? It's also how it's impacting our hormones, even outside of our cycle. Like if we are getting depleted in our hormones from a day-to-day -day basis, and obviously we're going to be much more susceptible to those depletions at certain points in our cycle when perhaps progesterone is already low at a natural point or estrogen is already low at a natural point in our cycle. So, um, so that's super helpful. The other way that we tend to see a lot of hormonal dysfunction happening is because of what is known as xenoestrogens or xenobiotics. And these are chemicals that are endocrine disruptors. I can never say that. It's too safe. <laughs> I know. Endo endocrine disruptors are basically chemicals that interfere with our body's ability to either make or break down our hormones. Uh, and it's not just sex hormones, it's other hormones as well. And so like thyroid and, you know, cortisol and all of those. And so, you know, that's another really big reason why we really focus in on that detox, uh, detoxification in your body's ability to break things down, but also your exposure. It starts with your exposure, right? So that's one of the reasons why there's all that, so all this, all the people out there that say you need to clean up, you know, the, the chemicals that you use for cleaning, get them out of your life, uh, avoid pesticide foods, go organic. That's why is because those things are actually messing with our hormones. So, um, so Dr. Barry did a really great job of succinctly describing why stress is a big, uh, big player there. I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can test for the hormones. So there is, you know, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to pretty much hundred percent of them that said, well, I, I know it's a hormone. There's definitely a hormonal piece, but every time I have my hormones tested, it comes back normal. And um, the reason why is because when we are testing in blood, there's a couple problems. One, I have to say probably nine times out of 10, 
when I look on the lab for the interpretation range, there is not any specific date like of the cycle. So nobody is telling people or telling you to go in and have your blood draw at a certain point in your cycle. So if we don't know where you are in your cycle, when you have your blood draw, then we don't know what reference range to look at. And in a lot of cases, when we figure out what day you were drawn at, we can actually look at the appropriate reference range rather than just the whole thing, which can go from like, three to 400. Yeah, pretty much everybody is going to fall within that range, but it's much different if it's in your luteal phase versus your follicular phase, which are the two halves of your cycle, pre-ovulation and post-ovulation. So that's a really important piece to understand. You should never have your hormones drawn without somebody asking you where you are in your cycle. Okay. So clearly this is a, a, a hot button issue for me, right? I got to work. <laughs> So blood, blood testing is just a snapshot of the hormones that are free in the blood and hormones, sex, our sex hormones specifically are, um, they're fat molecules. So in order to transport fat in water, it has to be bound to something to allow it to get where it needs to go. And unless we're testing those protein molecules that are binding the hormones, we're not really getting an accurate picture from a blood standpoint to get a full understanding of how much uh, of your hormones are actually in your blood. So they're just testing what's free in there. They're not testing bound. They're not testing, testing the sex hormone binding globulins. They're not testing a lot of these other pieces. So we're missing a huge chunk of that information. So for that reason, we like to do either the, sal and the salivary testing is actually looking at the amount that are that is present in your saliva, which they use as a general uh, understanding of the rest of the tissues in your body, right? And so there's actually quite a bit of research now showing that this is actually more accurate to test for than blood testing. Blood testing is the gold standard if you're monitoring hormone doses. So if you're monitoring um, bioidentical or hormone replacement therapies, then blood testing is still the gold standard for that. But the urine and the, uh, the urine and the salivary testing are actually showing to be more accurate in understanding risk factors for things like cancers, hormone related cancers in, um, in balancing our hormones and just in general, how we feel. So, and the reference ranges there are completely different than the reference ranges found in blood tissue or in, in blood samples. The other piece that I think is really important that you can't get from blood is your estrogen to progesterone ratio. So this is something that in my opinion, you can't test hormones and understand if you have a normal hormone uh, level or not, if you're not testing this ratio. And basically what it is, is it's estrogen in comparison to progesterone, right? It's a ratio of the two. We should optimally be around 200 to one progesterone to estrogen, right? 200 times more progesterone than we have estrogen. This is what studies have found. We feel good. Our mood is more stable. We have nice periods as opposed to the horrendous ones that come. Uh, we have less mood swings, less irritability, anxiety symptoms. We have better sleep, you know, all of those things. So this comes around that 200 to one ratio. Typically when I test anyone with chronic migraine, what I see is anywhere from a 10 to one to a 50 to one ratio. That's four times lower progesterone than we should be seeing for someone to feel good. And their progesterone and their estrogen can be in normal range. But when that ratio is off, that means that they are estrogen dominant, which means that they have more estrogen than they do progesterone to block the inflammatory and excitatory effects of estrogen. So if you think of it like estrogen is our excitatory, more excitatory, more anxiety provoking, um, it's more stimulating, it's more pro-inflammatory. Progesterone is the opposite. It is more calming, it is more sleep inducing, it is more anti-inflammatory. And so obviously we want more of that than we want of the estrogen. And that can be a reason, especially when I hear people with estrogen dominant symptoms relating to their cycle, really heavy periods, fibroids, cysts, um, endometriosis, uh, you know, really painful period cramps, those kinds of things tells me even if their estrogen progesterone is normal, they are estrogen dominant. And we need to do things to help support that ratio in order for them to feel better. And you can't do that without with blood testing. You have to do that with um, a functional test to really understand the tissue levels and what's going on from a ratio standpoint.
Dr. B. One thing that comes to mind as I listen to you talk is I'm wondering, all right, you, you said that there are ways to kind of bump up the progesterone and decrease the estrogen. Is that, um, you know, taking hormones? Is that other lifestyle measures, you know, food, sleep, that mm-hmm. kind of thing? What is it that helps fix that ratio? All of the above. Yes. Okay. So stress management is huge for the exact reason that you showed. Our body tends to, you know, for women with sight with our that are cycling, we need that estrogen, right? That's part of what our body does. So we tend to make to to prefer the estrogen standpoint, right? Progesterone is almost the first one to go, the last one to be made, if you will. So if there's that drain with estrogen and cortisol, then progesterone is the first thing that we start seeing suffer as a result. So the stress management piece is absolutely essential when it comes to trying to balance hormones. You cannot do it if the stress is not, you know, addressed. So that being said, there are things you can do some supplementation with pregnenolone. alone. You can do supplementation with adrenal support to help reduce that demand for cortisol. You can do some DHEA um, in some of those things. And there are also some, uh, some food options. You know, you can do things from a food standpoint to help support estrogen progesterone uh, balancing by, you know, maybe kind of cycling some of the es- pro estrogen and pro progesterone foods. So you can actually Google a list of, foods that support progesterone. There's a list of them. You can do things like seed cycling. If you haven't heard of that, there's, um, there are certain seeds that will produce, uh, that will help to boost progesterone. And there's certain seeds that help to produce estrogen that have phytoestrogens in them. So you can cycle the seeds according to where you are in your cycle. That can be a way that you can um, help to bring that balance, that back in balance, getting rid of those chemicals that will stimulate estrogens. And so, you know, a lot of our cleaning products, a lot of our personal care products, things with fragrances in it, horrible. They're very pro-estrogen, pro-inflammatory. And everything that we do from our lotion to our shampoos, to our hair care, to our makeup, all have fragrance in it. So that is just a foundational thing that if we can switch that out, that can make a huge impact as well. So a lot of it is exposure and stress taking care of those two things, really your body wants to be in balance. So that often is enough, but sometimes with us, when we're that out of balance, because we've been dealing with it for 20 years, we need a little bit more nudging. And then that's when either hormone replacement or actually doing some supplementation and and actively trying to target those can be more helpful. Hmm. All right, cool. And I'm just curious, are there, you mentioned fragrances, are there certain things in our environment that tend to be more endocrine disruptors than others? Like, are there any chemicals I should look out for? Yeah. So again, that fragrance is a really bad one. Um, okay. Any of the phthalates um, and uh, like the what are, and things. Oh, what are phthalates in? What are Oh my goodness. BPA is, BPA is in plastic, right? Correct. So plastics, yep. you see no BPA, plastics. Yep. Okay. So got that yep. one. Yeah. I mean, plastics in general are very, so unfortunately, like everybody is like no BPA because they all got, uh, you know, they're all aware BPA is bad. Well, what they use to replace BPA is just as bad. So yeah, uh, BPA free, but anything plastic is just not going to be good, especially if you're going to be using it with food. So stay okay. away from plastics. Um, and that's where a lot of your phthalates are and things like that. Um, I think oh, okay. there's some found in uh, in like styrofoam and stuff. We never want to heat styrofoam yeah. around our food or, or liquids. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then you can also, in a lot of not clean products, like um, certain makeups and uh, certain hair care products, shampoos, conditioners, um, stylers, things like that can all contain phthalates. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of them are now getting away from that because people are becoming more aware of it, but it's still, um, it still can be pretty prevalent. So you just have to, to do some research. That we've mentioned before, the ewg.org is a wonderful mm-hmm. website to help understand if there are chemicals in something you're using that are endocrine disruptors. Yep. And my takeaway from this session that we're doing here today is I need to switch to Pyrex. No more plastic yes. storage containers for leftovers. Yes, I need yes, I'm yes. going to Target today. I'm doing it. <laughs> Love it. That is a wonderful first step. I would. I applaud you. Very good. <laughs> Um, one of the best things that you can do to help with migraines and hormone balancing is that stress management piece. And if Thank anybody you. has any questions about hormones, uh, hormone testing, things like that, feel free to drop a link in the chat and we'll be happy to answer your questions for you. Bye everybody.